and she is going to be presenting on how to present at your first conference. So um, um, just a little bit of background about Dr. Chen. Um, she came here first as um, a student um, in the master's in teaching program. Yes, um, and then um, continued um, on, got her PhD here, and now is um, teaching as a full-time faculty member here. So I would like to give a warm welcome and a, a big thanks to Dr. Wayna Chen, who has always been a great advocate for her students and encouraging them to present at conferences and um, uh, guiding them in their professional lives. Um, and um, Wayna, you can just let us know what you'd like to do about questions then. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. So just quick answer for the questions. If you have any uh, questions that are related to what I am just talking about, you can just chime in and ask for like quick questions. I can answer that right away so it doesn't get lost. But if it's something you know you think it will need a little more time to explain, then we can leave at the end. Uh, I plan for like 10 to 15 minutes Q&A, so tr probably should have plenty of time. Yeah. So Gina, should we get started? Okay. Um, and thank you for everyone for coming. Um, if you don't know me yet, uh, my name is Weina Li Chen. I am a clinical assistant professor at Pepperdine uh, GSCP. Um, I started as a um, visiting instructor when I was doing my PhD second year. So I felt I always feel very blessed to get this position. Um, and I believe, you know, presenting in conferences, uh, and I did a lot. <laughs> I believe this experience really helped me to um, uh, kind of pave the way at where I am right now. So I'm so glad to be able to share my uh, experience presenting at conferences and just some insights and some tips with you today and hopefully will help you um, as well. So I will share the screen. Okay. Um, so here you go. <laughs> Um, this is today's agenda, uh, a quick check-in activity, and I want to talk about plan ahead of your conference for the whole year and how to submit to a conference, how to identify reputable uh, or predatory conferences, uh, and prepare to speak at a conferences, uh, at a conference and Q&A. So uh, first, I would like to just uh, show you a picture of me in a conference with uh, probably like 150 people. <laughs> that was actually uh, in 2019, uh, still you know early years of my presentation, but it was a good turnout. So, um, so I feel proud to share that, uh, also encouragement, encouragement. But I now I want to take a pause and just ask you to show hands, um, like how many of you already have conferences uh, experience? Um, and do not feel obligated. So if you have attended a conference, can you raise your hand? Yeah, good. And how many of you have tried to submit to a conference before? All right. And uh, uh, how many have you, uh, how many of you have presented at a conference before? Nice, very good. So we do have some veterans here. <laughs> Glad to see that. So um, feel free to use the chat box to chime in, you know, whenever there is a question or something that you feel like to share as well. So uh, my conference experience is I started to present in 2018 um, in my first year of a PhD student. Uh, and then I had volunteered in conferences, I have attended conferences. So I had attended conferences before I presented in conference. And I would uh, encourage the similar path so you do not feel overwhelmed and you know what is happening, right? And actually that help you to feel confident of submitting a proposal because you see them like, oh, I can do something like that, right? So, um, and uh, to be honest, the picture I showed you is 150 people, right? But I have presented in a conference room with three people also. So that's very normal. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Like you might have a big audience or a small audience really based on how the conference is organized and how your topics uh, is, you know, related, right? Sometimes you might have a very specific topic, but it is like 
related to your passion and your research, even though with a small number of present uh, attendees, it doesn't mean anything, right? Uh, it, so it's a debate. Like I tell myself, do you want just to present in a popular session or do you want to continue to dig what you are passionate about, right? So my first session, I can show you later <laughs> and you can tell why uh, it had a good turnout. Uh, but anyway, let me continue share uh, the screen. So the second question is um, for you to participate just a little bit for now. What are some questions you want to get answered today? And feel free to put that in the chat box. So I want to see just uh, what questions you have coming into the space. And uh, as we go, I probably will tell you, oh, these questions will be answered, right? Or if there are some questions I didn't prepare, I will um, try to cover that during my presentation. So um, free, feel free to just type in the chat box. How to make our long presentation more fun and interact with the audience. <laughs> That's probably good for uh, any comp students and uh, dissertation students as well. Uh, I was wondering about how to find the right conferences. Okay, for sure, we will uh, talk about that um, to apply to. And uh, Inva for the long presentation, more fun and interact. I do not have detail, but I did mention engagement strategies in this presentation. Uh, Jackie, detail. <laughs> okay, Lisa, what elements are expected to a academic poster, introduction, uh, RQ methodology, and okay. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I'll uh, mention a little bit about that, but every conference is different. So you'll have to see the rubric and their calls. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much for um, participating in this question. And as we go, feel free to leave the questions in the chat box. So uh, our first thing I plan is um, plan ahead. Uh, this is my strategy of having a um, a productive year of conference presentations. So, for example, you need to ask yourself how many conference presentations you you would like to have, right? In for, for example, in twenty twenty three, or let's plan ahead for next year, twenty twenty four, right? Or the school year, twenty twenty three to twenty twenty four. So, let's say if you want to have, um, let's start from small, like three, right? So that means you probably need to submit to five, right? Or six uh, to guarantee you will have the minimum goals that you can achieve. So I will say backward plan all the time, right? So first set up the goal, how many presentations in total you want to achieve in 2023, and then find those conferences. And then what are their conferences, uh, conference dates, right? So for example, you cannot have all five conferences in March that will kill you, right? So plan uh, conferences that can spread uh, throughout the year. So that gives you time to submit the proposals, work on your presentation slides and travel. Um, I do have a colleague like travel with five conferences in March. <laughs> Not gonna name the name, but he's crazy. <laughs> no, he's really, really good. But for beginners, you need to start slow. Um, so next is, next step is, what are their call for proposals deadline, right? So we backward the conference date, what are the deadlines for proposals? Actually, today there is a deadline for uh, the VERA conference, WERA, uh, which I missed, <laughs> which is okay. Um, but next is when will you work on your proposal? So my strategy is using Google Calendar and the um, to-do list on my mobile phone. But also you should write it down maybe on a whiteboard for the whole year, like you know, this is only conference, right? Because you're also learning, studying, maybe teaching, maybe you want to submit a couple of um, journals. So everything has to be uh, planned out. So you have enough time to uh, work on those proposals. So this is an example I uh, just uh, made up. Well, kind of uh, real because uh, I am presenting in TESOL this year, 2023. So. I will list the conferences I picked and want to go. So put on the column, uh, second column, right? Tiso, Vera, Kabe, and Katiso. So among these four conferences, I know Kabe and Katiso is guaranteed. Like I should get in without much problem. So you want to maybe have some backup, not backup, but some guarantees like, oh, these two conferences, I'm confident, right? Because I've submitted multiple times and I know it, it's not that competitive. Um, 
but Vera Tiso, I'm not sure, right? But I really, really want to be there. So those top two are my choices too. And um, if you want to more conferences, then list uh, the rest of it. So first find out their conferences date and then location, then CFP is call for proposals deadline, right? So now I have TSO in August this year, Vera March is March 15 this year, but they have a later deadline. So it's okay to miss the early deadline. So in um, 2024, Kave is July, somewhere July, 2023. Katizo is somewhere July, June, July, 2023. So I just listened them there. So now you have the deadlines for all the presentation proposals. You need to plan uh, when do you prepare to set, submit your proposals, right? So uh, according to the deadlines, I wrote my preparation time. So the last column is really tailored to what you, um, like your time, what time you have to work on those proposals. So hopefully this chart helps and everyone has your own, you know, system. This works for me and I use a um, uh, Google Sheet to organize this. And whenever I finish the proposal, I will like highlight it. And then uh, whenever my proposal get accepted, I will update it in my um, own website. So all the scholarly activity don't get lost. Right. Can you see there's a chat? Oh, no worries. Um, um, actually, round table there, session. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. I was just going to bring that up, Lena. And I don't know if this mm -hmm. is the time you want to talk about it, but Lena asked, what are round table sessions? Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you'll be getting to that a little bit later. Uh, I can <laughs> I can uh, just answer that very quickly because I have been sitting around uh, presenting a round table and also have attended a round table session at AERA. Basically, they're round tables, <laughs> and you are sitting in round tables with other colleagues. And some tables will be full, like ten people. Some sessions will be smaller, like two people, right? Um, but it's okay. Those two showed up. They're really interested in your topic. Right, so uh, a lot of roundtable sessions depends on the organizer. So a lot of roundtable sessions are other presenters as well. So they are all presenting in the similar topic. So they are kind of like an idea exchange in that smaller setting, right? Uh, so I do like roundtable a lot. Yeah, but some organizations they do roundtable with only one uh, topic. Then you're the only presenter for that roundtable, and other people who joined your table is the um, attendees and uh, people will come and go right if they kind of talk to you and think it's good enough they will jump to another table because it's like a very open setting uh, kind of like a cafe style right so uh, and do not take that personal just um, yeah it's very casual it's kind of like a poster session but more sitting down more structured yeah thank you um, so much thank you yeah no problem. So uh, let's talk about submit to a conference. So I know some of you have already done this already uh, before. So feel free to add tips to the chat box uh, if you see any. I don't think I covered everything <laughs> because my list is getting long. So I'm like, okay, let me stop here. But some general rules. Uh, first, you need to read the call and guideline, right? We were talking about like, uh, what are some criteria for a poster session? And each conference is different. So for example, AERA, uh, any abstract you submit, you need to have at least, uh, not at least, more, no more than 2,000 words, right? But they're expecting maybe 1,800 words. You cannot submit 150 words. But some conferences will request only 150 words abstract. Doesn't say they're bad conferences. It just depends on the conference um, style and uh, their, uh, their rigor and their uh, target audience. For example, the first conference I presented at is called CAVE, California Association for Bilingual Education. So they only requested 150 words, right? Uh, and it was a good conference and still people don't get in, um, but it was a professional conference with teacher educators. So they do not need like research methods or you know uh, your, your research questions and methodologies. So um, it's much easier for beginners, I, I would say especially if you're practitioners. Um, so, but yeah, of course, read the call. What are their themes? What are yearly themes? 
because if you see the second point is read the rubrics very carefully because uh, the, the rubrics sometimes in, uh, include like a column, not column, a, a row with like, is this proposal related to the year theme, the, this year's theme, right? Uh, so I have been a conference proposal reviewer for a few times uh, and I have seen some good proposals, like really good, but if they do not have a uh, category that rubrics ask for, for example, if they didn't mention the participant's outcome, then they get zero point for that uh, area, right? So it's likely being declined. So the rubric is really gold because every peer reviewers will use the rubric to evaluate your proposal. So it doesn't matter the topic is like, you know, very attracting or um, or like the writing is very good, but it has to uh, fulfill what the conference is asking for. So uh, go to the submission system and familiar, like, familiar, familiarize yourself. Uh, this step is small, but important because once you are in the system, you're like, oh, actually this is manageable, right? Like I know where to go. And also you do not want to um, have any last minute problem like, oh, I wrote everything, but you know, on this day, the last day of the deadline, I couldn't submit because I don't know, I had a hard time register uh, to the, uh, the system. So first, before you even start writing the proposal, I would encourage just to play around with the system and see what they're asking for. Uh, let me see, um, like for example, this one, it's the Vera one. Uh, so I just logged in and want to show you how it looks like. So, so it will ask you which conference you're submitting, right? You just pick. In submission type, some conference will allow you to choose multiples, and then they will uh, kind of assign you based on what they think is the best. Um, for AERA, I think you can only choose one. I'm not 100% sure, but some conferences are like can only choose one. Like for example, abstract title, <laughs> I put chat GPT because I was thinking about something about like doing some research about that in the future. An abstract topic, you choose, see, there's a list of things that kind of a sub theme, right? You want to choose. So under, um, I would choose under emerging technology and education. So abstract summary, only up to 250 words. So that's very manageable. And any supporting documents, if you have any graphics, write charts, sure, submit it with it. And then your author name and everything, if you have a co-author out there, and submit. See, if you see this, like, wow, that's like much easier than I thought. It's basically a Google form, right? So I would just encourage you to explore those systems. But some systems are harder, like AERA, you know, oh, wow, this is like, like 10 pages of call I need to read. And I need to write 2,000 words abstract and maybe 300 words, uh, um, no, 2,000 words paper and 300 words um, abstract. But by doing that, you have the expectation, know how many time, how much time you can allocate for uh, that task. And then after this, writing to write according to the call and rubrics, right? And then again, use the rubrics to evaluate your own proposal. It's a good step. I do that to see if I kind of meet all the criteria and make changes if needed. Yeah, you can even ask um, your um, colleagues or professors to do that uh, with you. Grammarly, Writing Center, right? Uh, especially if English is not your main language, first language, I work with Gina a lot, right? Uh, especially at the beginning when I wasn't feel confident, comfortable uh, with my writing. So, but even your native speakers uh, still um, ask for Gina and Carlos help is a, a great addition, yeah. Uh, I do have a small tip here is uh, always prepare for topics that you could present about. This means do not start think about topic when you see the call. It's kind of too late, right? You want to, like when you're working, wh while you're studying, you're like, oh, micro, uh, micro learning. I, I, I am really interested about that. And this semester, I wrote a paper about that. I did some research. So let me put that onto my potential presentation topic, right? So you kind of in, 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 uh, embed that into your database. So, and then you can start working on some 
um, areas of that topic that you can present about. So when a conference comes, especially relate to the topic that you already have in your database, it will be much easier for you to continue write the abstract. Okay, let's check the chat again. Uh, do we have a database of poster proposals that have been submitted? I I don't think so. Um, you can ask for people to see if they're willing to share with you their proposals. Um, but yeah, we do not have a database that has all the proposals being submitted. Um, Stephanie, do the evaluators and submission team typically take into account how many social media followers? <laughs> uh, depends on the conference. I think um, like two CUE uh, conference, which is about learning technology, uh, it might matter. But uh, for conferences that are peer reviewed, uh, your authorship is not shown uh, in the evaluate, you know, in the back end. They do not see who you are um, when they're evaluating your proposal. They only see um, the proposal itself. Um, they don't, oh, thank you, Inva. <laughs> yeah, so, so only professional conferences, especially if they are inviting uh, keynote speakers, right? So that can be a big factor, yeah. All right, so a few tips. Um, I put tips here because they're kind of random, doesn't really catch your eyes to anywhere. <laughs> okay, so tip one is once you have identified the conferences in your research professional domain, subscribe to the website, right? Register as a member or find ways to be connected because by doing so, you will get email notifications whenever a call for proposal is, is out, <laughs> it's cut out. Um, so I, I do this to all the major conferences and following like AERA, WERA, TSO, CAVE. So whenever the conferences uh, call for proposals are out, I get an email right away. So that way you are always being notified, right? Um, and you do not get lost with the, the deadlines. Um, so it's a good practice to have. And, Try not to register as a paid member because that would be a lot of money. But there are some ways to connect, like sign up their email list, right? Or um, be a like website uh, member. So they can, uh, yeah, as, as long as you're part of their um, mailing list, uh, you will get all the emails. So the next uh, tip is some conferences have graduate student forum or doctoral student forum or they say master's student forum, um, and other opportunities for submission. Like for example, SIG, SIG is special interest groups, uh, calls for proposals. So those um, opportunities give graduate students a better chance to get into the conferences. So they do have a separate uh, review board. Uh, they sometimes have a separate deadline that is later than the main deadline. So for example, if you miss the um, AERA deadline, uh, then you can look closely into the SIG groups, right? Uh, to see if there are other additional opportunities for student presenters. So I put a picture here. It was me presenting at 2019 AERA Research Dialogic Forum, right? AERA is super competitive and like it's the big, biggest top, the top um, educational conference in the US. So for me, I didn't submit a proposal that year because that requests a lot of rigor, like 2,000 words. But uh, when I saw they have a, a research dialogic forum for graduate students, it's kind of like a mentorship program. I just um, submit my proposal right away and I was able to present. And uh, that was like the mentor faculty uh, at that time when I was a graduate student. So try to look for those opportunities um, as those are great um, pathway. Uh, and experiences as well. And I got, I got an AERA certificate. <laughs> How nice was that, right? Okay, so uh, next tip, I will check the chat box after this tip. Uh, so from no experience to the first experience is always the most overwhelming step. Uh, so if you do not feel comfortable to submit or and uh, present by yourself, find a professor or a colleague, right? Your peer, your cohort members who has Done it before and to seek for support or partnership. So 
So uh, how I started my presentation journey is uh, in 2017 summer, I attended a proposal writing workshop hosted by Dr. Gashi Ramos. And she basically just pulled out the website, you know, kind of what I showed you earlier, like this is the system, let's submit today, right? Let's see how many proposals we can submit. So there were like maybe five of us, five, seven of us. And I think we submitted three. <laughs> Um, so uh, I submitted and got accepted successfully. And now you can see earlier, I told you I had a good turnout because the, the topic was building a happy and motivated language class through game-based learning, right? And then the audience of that conference were all teacher educators. So who don't want game-based learning and motivation and happy class? So, um, and it's now researchy, right? It's very practitioner-based. So I provide a lot of um, concrete ideas uh, to give to the teachers to take away so they can use the second day in their classroom. All right, so let me check the chat again. Check the chat again. Grammarly Premium, yes. Uh, and with Pepperdine, right? We have free access. Uh, is there a database or conference? How do we find a conference in the first place? Um, I will talk about how to identify some reputable conferences or predatory conferences, but um, I believe there is a list of conferences that have been circling around uh, from education, at least, but it is very hard because everyone is in different domains, right? So for me, I have a list, but it's for like learning, education, and TESO, like language education. So it will be different than what you have uh, in mind with your topics. So my best way is just to start researching and find your own database. Yeah, build your own database. It doesn't have to be big, right? Uh, it can be a good amount of uh, conferences that is reputable that uh, you are familiar with and you can start to build your network relationship and then start to have leadership roles in those conferences as well. All right, um, okay. so uh, here you go. Our next topic is identify reputable or predatory conferences. They're either way, I guess. Um, so first is uh, check who is the organizer, right? Uh, if the organizer is like nothing you have heard about, that can be a red flag and you can read, you can search about it on Google, right? If it's a university, it's probably not a predatory conference, right? If it's like a very rigorous um, a research institution like ARA, yeah, you know it's it's not. But if it's something called like world research cluster, <laughs> it's a real one, then you know it's uh, it's a little problematic. So next one is who are presenting? So how do you find that out, right? First, you can check conference program books from previous years. So for example, if you saw 2021 um, conference program book has um, like uh, the presenters from Harvard, Yale, Pepperdine, right? See, I'm putting Pepperdine with the same Harvard and Yale, but like, you know, all the good, conference, uh, good universities. That's legit. But if you see the university you never heard of, like, or Phoenix, <laughs> sorry, this is recorded. I probably shouldn't mention names. But like, if all the universities are from like, you know, uh, not really good uh, institutions, then you know it can be problematic, right? Um, so uh, another trick I found is check, uh, but not all conferences will put this online, but uh, some conferences will do. Like for example, how many attendees uh, from are, were there from 2021? So for example, there are 3,000 attendees and then they will, tell you how many sessions were there. And there are 3000 sessions <laughs> that you know, okay, everyone's there is a presenter. Okay, so as long as they miss something, I'll be there. So will you really want to be there if that's the conference you, you, you're going, right? So be careful. <laughs> so how long is the review period? So I want to show you an example. Um, uh, as you can see earlier, uh, my uh, example, right? So conference date is March. The call for proposal deadline is August. So they had a few months, right? Like almost half a year to review. Um, and AERA, same thing. WERA actually is uh, not too bad. It's uh, in the same year. Um, Kabe, 
even though it's easier to get in, at least for me, <laughs> but it's, it's a very long review period because they're larger organizations and they have people to review those proposals. So that take time. But what if I show you this one, uh, submission deadline, March 12th, registration deadline, March 16th, conference date, March 27th to 28th. So I think you will see what's going on there, right? This conference from the Universal Research Cluster, you cannot submit somewhere like 10 days or 15 days before the conference and then have legit review of it. So you can kind of expect they will accept everything because they want to get you there. All right, um, go back to, wait, not this one. Okay, so an uh, unusual broad focus. Uh, here is another uh, website I want to show you. So this uh, is called allconferencealert.com. So you will see the topics over here, right? Uh, it covers everything like you can think of. Like everyone can find a kind of a space they, they think they can present at. And then that can be a uh, red flag. So, uh, and now you see Bahamas. Wow, what a nice location, right? So, um, um, so if you see check below, right? International Conference of Multi Multidisciplinary Research, and then Applied Science, Engineering Technology, Green Energy and Environment Technology, Cybersecurity, and Social Science, Teach and Learning, um, and it's all from the same organization. And then look at the date, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19. So that's a big red flag over there as well. So very unusual broad focus. Unless, of course, there are some conferences like they are broad, like ARA is just education, but they're very reputable and you will recognize them right away. But if there's something that you never heard of and has just like very a broad topic, you can take a deeper look, closer look into that. So an uh, unusual vacation place, Maldives, 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 Bahamas, or even cruise. Like you can have a conference <laughs> in cruise, on cruise, right? That's um, problematic, but you never know. Like Hawaii has some nice conferences too, right? So it, it all depends. You have to look into the, the factors uh, altogether. But uh, whenever you see conference like this, just to do a little bit more research on that. Um, or a organization with a list of dozen or more conferences. Oh, I kind of show you the example, right? On the different focuses on the same day or similar days at the same place. So that's a red flag for sure. Um, or a higher presenter's registration fee. So the conferences I um, presented before normally give you a cheaper presenter uh, fee or a free registration because they value your work, right? They want to um, give you some kind of discount um, or accommodation to invite you to be there. Um, but at least it should be same to attendees. If they charge more than the attendees uh, fee, then uh, it's also a red flag. So my question is, what are some of your ways to identify, uh, you know, reputable or predatory conferences? Uh, Didi, I will give you the PowerPoint. Um, I think I will send it to Gina and uh, Carlos. Uh, so they will send out with the recording of the session as well. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I miss any questions in the chat box, feel free to just unmute and ask. So I know some of us has, um, you know, look into conferences or presented or submitted before. Is there any other ways that I didn't mention that you think could be helpful to other um, students to know? To reflect those <laughs> um, um, predatory conferences? All right, so I guess I covered a lot of it. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. So um, how to prepare to speak at a conference? Uh, I uh, by go out to talk about public speaking, right? <laughs> That's not really my um, territory and 
I don't think very good public speaker anyway. But <laughs> I my focus right. is, <laughs> thank you. But I think my focus is to give you some tips about preparing for that conference uh, presentation. And uh, uh, sorry for the long, you know, very very clustered slide. Want to include that in all one page. So first of all, some logistic issues, right? Before you are actually speaking at the conference, uh, many conferences when they send out the congratulations, right? They will ask you to accept. So make sure you read the email carefully. <laughs> Don't just like go celebrate. So you you need to like for some conferences you need to accept to be able to uh, be included in the final program. So that's a critical step. You do not want to submit everything, right? All the hard work, and then because of that, and didn't get to present. So after you accept, they probably will ask you to uh, register for a conference. Um, and after your registration, they will provide the uh, presentation date. So some conference will have four days, right? But you have your des designated time. For example, March 22nd, 1 p.m. to uh, 1.45. So make sure you put that in your calendar and start to plan your logistics. Like for example, accommodation, some co bigger conferences will give you a special discount uh, if you uh, reserve the accommodation through their website. So, uh, and you can of course arrange your own accommodation and travel plans. Um, and then, keep receipts for reimbursement if possible. I put this one last minute because I remember GSCP actually has a $400 reimbursement for student presenters. Gina doesn't know? <laughs> yeah, so this is awesome. Uh, if you have a accepted presentation, so all you need to do is just to gather all your receipts. Um, this covers everything uh, except alcohol. <laughs> so uh, hotel, um, flights, registration fee, uh, even your food, right? Uh, but it's only up to $400. Um, so you can submit everything, but the maximum dollars they can give is $400. If you do not know how to get the form for reimbursement, I will include um, in my PowerPoint with to Gina and Carlos so they can send that out to you as well. Yeah. Um, so, and I don't know uh, like how many programs you are coming from, but if your uh, program chair supports you, for example, with your presentation, you can probably even ask for more if you are over the budget and see if they can provide anything from their chair, right? Uh, uh, charge string or something like that. Um, session types. So when you are preparing to speak in a conference, uh, first of all, when you submit, you, you knew which tag you submitted, right? You choose round table, poster, paper session, workshop, depends on conference, there are more. Uh, and then when they return your acceptance, they will let you know which uh, type of the session you will be presenting at. So uh, I have heard some students submit a poster session, but being upgraded to a paper session. So make sure you have uh, you read that clearly. So for example, for paper sessions, uh, normally, they will uh, ask you to upload the final paper uh, by a certain deadline uh, before the conference. Um, so that requires additional work, right? Well, everyone, everything will <laughs> request additional work, but final paper, you need to plan ahead and don't write the last day before the presentation. Uh, for poster sessions, uh, also check for guidelines because some conferences will ask for electronic poster so they have all the fancy screens Everyone, uh, everyone's poster session will be on a screen, but some conferences, they ask for a printed poster. So that way you have to print ahead of time and bring that with you uh, to the airport or print it in the location in the conference, right? So, um, and some conferences will give you very detailed guideline of like the measurement of the poster. So those are things to prepare. So uh, when you're speaking, uh, poster and round tables are very interactive. You are talking to people and having conversations. So, uh, so the structure can be, I would say, uh, less formal. When you're doing paper session workshops, uh, like I'm doing today, right? Like one person talking, not so much interaction. Uh, for me, 
personally, I like to provide an agenda preview just to give them a um, kind of uh, what's going on today, what's going to happen. So if they decide to stay, they stay. If they think, oh, I only want to hear the first two points and don't want to listen to the rest, then they can leave for another session. Because uh, many times the attendees are very busy and they want to mo attend multiple sessions at the same time. And um, larger conferences like Kave and AERA, they have like 10 sessions happening at the same time or 20 sessions. So it's hard to, uh, to for them to commit to one session many times. Uh, engagement strategies. Uh, I think Inva was asking that question earlier. Um, we don't have time to elaborate on that, but I think it's really critical to have a engagement strategy uh, or strategies ahead of time because uh, I can give you an example, not me, but I have witnessed um, the session. Uh, when it began, right, when it began, it was like full room, right? Like 50 people. But uh, I, I think I'm a little rose facing now. I don't know if you can still hear me. Yeah, okay. So, um, and by maybe like 10, 12 minutes in, guess how many people left? Uh, like stage in the room, three, three, four, three, four people. That's it. So all the people who in, were interested in that session, in the topic, because of I guess how the speaker presented and um, engaged, they all left. Uh, it was a little hard to watch, but um, that's how it how it was, right? So think about how you can engage your audience. Uh, you can provide some questions at the beginning, some interactive activities, some think parents share, let them talk to each other, uh, or a workshop, you can provide hands-on activities, maybe templates, they can work on a sheet. And Because uh, for me, if I am the participant, I want to know what I will get a, away from the session, right? what I can actually produce. So if you give them a goal, a aim or something they can play with to mess around, um, they actually are engaging. So um, yeah, I think that's the, <laughs> the, the, the some points I can talk about. Yeah, um, but feel free to have uh, additional conversation with me, you know, if you want to learn more about how you engage, how I engage with my audience. Yeah, uh, visual aids, right? That's part of the engagement strategies as well. So uh, I have seen people right presenting without anything, just reading on their paper, <laughs> like physical paper. It's not even like PowerPoint, not no PowerPoint. So have some sort of visual aid helps, um, and be be prepared for different turnouts, right? So how you engage and present to a smaller number of audience versus how you present with a large number of audience will be very different. So one time when I was presenting with like. A ballroom, right? Like 150, 20 people. And I had no microphone, right? Um, it was really, really challenging to um, amplify my voice. Uh, the turnout was good, but um, but I was prepared my activities with both numbers of audience. So even with a large number of audience, I still had them running around and <laughs> doing things. Um, because you had that backup plan ahead of time. Like, okay, let me role play. Now I'm facing only three of my audience, how I'm gonna do. So when I presented with three audience, it was good. I wasn't standing in front of the, the po uh, podium. I sat down with them in a circle. I moved the chairs and we, we had a kind of like a round table conversation. And it was beneficial, and I got to learn a lot from the uh, part um, participants, and they got to ask a lot of questions as well. So um, next is practice a few rounds. Um, I personally, not anymore, but I used to record my voice uh, multiple times and listen just for improvement, especially for your first conference. You know, that's, well, maybe it's a little bit extreme, but I do that all the time, like for my first teaching, Right for my first teaching in graduate level, I do that just to prepare. Um, but if you're confident speaker having outlines and practice, and you do not even need to record yourself, might be good enough. Um, don't forget to bring your business cards. I always forget this, <laughs> and they will ask for my email, uh, which can get lost. Right, 
like um, so business cards. And I always now prepare my slides for sharing. So I provide a QR code. Uh, I don't give them right away. I say at the end of the session, you can come to scan the QR code. Yeah. Um, so uh, last is technology check. Check with the conference providers uh, uh, or what people call the, the program assistant to see if they provide, they provide projector, computer, microphone, or any virtual options. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a small uh, part of the presentation, but it is also important. Like for example, I have a Microsoft Surface, right? It needs a special dongle. So you might want to bring those uh, small things just to avoid those technology challenge. Um, it can be a disaster if you have prepared everything so nicely and cannot really show the screen with like 200 people. That will be <laughs> right almost impossible to um, still carry on. But again, that's just your backup plan. So what do you have to like, what, what's your plan if anything, everything fails? with technology, can you still present, right? Um, all right, so I think that's all my part and I want to leave some time for the question and answers. Um, let me see. Thank you, Gina. What is $600? I saw a question. I think Infa was asking that she thought maybe the um, reimbursement was six hundred dollars um, now instead oh, of oh, really? four hundred. But I don't, I don't know. Um, Infa, do you want to say something about that? Hi, Dr. Wayne. Thank hey. you for that. <laughs> it's so good to see you here. The, yes, you well, just recently on a meeting that I had at school, it just said that it was at 600. Uh, so I was just wanting to share that with everybody. The only thing is that we do not have that, uh, the form. So if you, somebody can drop it off over here to the form, so that way we can fill that out. Uh, I mean, I've done conferences, but I've never got the reimbursement. So I just heard this like last week. So it would be nice for us to get reimbursed. So that way we can actually apply for new conferences. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope that's the, the good news. <laughs> I didn't know there is an increase of the number, but I can check with a colleague who has been doing my reimbursement when I was a student. So, uh, and I can get the most updated form for you. Okay. Um, hopefully that's $600 now because everything is increasing, right? The registration fee can be like $400 already. Yeah. Um, have, have you ever used Toastmasters? No, I haven't. Anyone has used it before? Please share. Um, okay, to be paid. Yes, uh, Jesse, probably you came in late. So, or you are talking about the reimbursement or being paid by the conference? Being paid by a conference. Like, is this something we always have to pay into to speak or are there opportunities eventually to become a paid speaker? I see, yeah. So thank you for asking a great question because this kind of like a meme now, like people are saying academia is you are producing valuable work and paying for other people to hear about your valuable work. <laughs> so normally you have to pay to present in conferences unless you're invited speaker. So uh, I was lucky to be invited um, in uh, actually a February conference uh, just this year. So I didn't pay anything and they even gave me a gift card. So that was nice, <laughs> but not, not as often. I think if you're being invited, it's more likely they will uh, include everything like accommodation, uh, of course the registration and uh, perhaps even a um, sort of like uh, compensation. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of conference experience, you're likely to be invited for the next step. Yeah. Uh, and when I was presenting about the game-based learning, uh, my participants were like school teachers and school administrators, right? And they were asking me after the presentation saying, can I do professional development to their school districts? So that's another way you keep building your network and opportunities. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um 
uh, Dr. Chen, I have a um, just Tian. She had uploaded the travel um, stipend application. So um, not oh, it's student travel. Sorry about that. Um, I that's the know. same thing. Oh, it's yeah. the same thing. Okay, yeah. great. So that's um, in the chat. And I just wanted to correct myself. And I think Wena, you can probably um, answer this better than I did, but I had suggested using Google Scholar to search for conferences, but actually, I think it's probably best to talk to the faculty here who are in your field and ask them. You won't find anything on Google Scholar except articles, so don't look on Google <laughs> Scholar, but um, talk to the faculty who you work closely with in your field because they will know the best conferences and be able to recommend them, and um, when did you have anything that you wanted to add to? Yes, totally. So um, since Tianxi is here, so I think he, he just did the right thing. He just let me know he wanted to present in conferences. If I have any opportunity, just send his send his, uh, him the way, right? The, forward the emails. So whenever I see a conference that is like related to what he can do, his interest, I just forward it to him. So I think just let people know, let professors know that uh, your colleagues know, let me know, even though I, I might not be in the expertise of everyone. Some of probably from psychology, right? From um, like leadership, leadership conferences are actually not a lot. Yeah, my focus was like educational conferences, learning design, like technology conferences, uh, and language conferences. So, uh, but if you know any professors who are sharing the, the same interests, research interests, same domain, then ask them, right? And for them, it's just like, they do not really go look into what conferences you can present because that's a lot to ask. But if you say, oh, if you get any email for, uh, call for proposals, can you just send me your way? It's like, yeah, that I can do. <laughs> yeah. um, Lina, a QR code, uh, do you use Bitly? Do I do I use what? Sorry, Dr. Chen. Uh, no, never used it before. Yeah, so Bitly, it's a QR code generator, also a short uh, short link generator. How do I explain that? So um, how, for example, my, uh, let's see okay, if I can do this. So see if we can uh, copy this website to your, um, okay. you know, to your uh, explorer. Let me see if I can. Yes. So I use Bitly to create a short link for my own personal website. Uh huh. Okay. So I will just show you very quickly. So that way you can have a customized short link to your website. Oh. Uh, so my, my is Bitly slash Winali Chen. Uh, okay. Oh, I think I just lost Zoom for a second. Yes. Yeah. We can hear you now, though. It's okay. Yeah. I was I was able to copy the link, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'll follow your screen now. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. So, like for example, scholarly activities, like I talked earlier, whenever I have something accepted, I put it here. So that way, uh, I have a ongoing uh, resume <laughs> or CV. For example, 2023 March, this is uh, not, it's happening soon, not yet, but I put this down when it, uh, when I got the uh, acceptance. My publication, some professional conferences. Yeah, like see this is in June, right? It's not happening yet, but I put it there just to as a placeholder so I don't get lost. Nice, okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Oh, Carlos, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there are tons of QR code generators online, right? So yeah, Wayne, I just noticed this is run by the Bitly company, this oh, website. So it's directed nice. to, to specifically generate the QR codes. So that's awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, 
I just want to say this was fantastic, um, Wena. I learned so much, and it doesn't seem as intimidating now to present at a conference, just from the way that you kind of broke it down. So thank you. This was wonderful. Yes, thank you. It's really not that uh, intimidating as we probably think it is. It's just mind game. Yeah, from zero to one is so hard. But once you have the first one, you can do like a million if you want to. <laughs> so thank you everyone for being here. Great. Yeah, and uh, my email, I can put it down, Lena Chen at pepperdine.edu. So if you want to um, talk to me separately or ask for any resources, I'm happy to um, connect with you. Thank you so, so much. And um, we really appreciate um, your being here, Wena, to do this. Um, wonderful. And um, we will be sending out a survey to all of you and we'd really appreciate your responding to it. We'll send you the link to it. Um, just so that we know what kinds of things you'd like um, in the future from writing support in terms of presentations. But this was uh, so wonderful, and we really appreciate um, your time, your energy, and all of your experience and wisdom in, uh, in presenting. So thank you so much again. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Carlos, Gina, for um, thank you. this thank space. You. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Have a great Bye. one, everyone. Bye, guys.